<laughs> did you hit the button? I did hit the button. Hmm. Wow. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Working um, at home. Okay, so this is what a live video looks like, huh? Uh, oh, I see the number. <laughs> there's other people out there? Yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. Cool. So we're just remote working from our home. I'm David, uh, CEO of Hacker Noon. This is Ling. Hi, I'm uh, Ling Smoke of Hacker Noon. All right, so let's um, just talk a little bit about uh, who we are and what Hacker Noon is while we wait for people to join. Uh, the if three people of you. join, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, hey, Rishab. Um, we're doing well. We're doing well. Um, it's working from home. It's 1 p.m. here in Colorado. Um, very beautiful, sunny day at first, and now it's a little bit more cloudy. Um, very grateful to be able to afford working from home in, during these times, absolutely. So I think that's why we agreed to um, do this in the first place. Our social media manager, Daria, was like, you guys got to get on this live thing. So like okay as uh, extremely <laughs> introverted people this is um quite nerve-wracking <laughs> so at, at hacker noon we have seven full-time employees and five part-time people and they're based other than us being in colorado uh none of the other ones have kids together um and they're based all over the world you know so hey michael uh we have um vietnam uh Michigan, Amsterdam. <laughs> relocated to Minnesota, previously yep. California. Uh, so our European division <laughs> is Germany and uh, Netherlands. Uh -huh. Hey, Jonathan. Who are all these people? Wow, we know. have all 11 people on here. But we have been running you know, a remote team for a couple of years now, and it's slowly getting bigger. We're still on kind of that small business, but we have large traffic. You know, so we have large community problems in terms of complaints from readers, complaints from writers, you know, making things work better. Because, you know, if you have 4 million people visit your site and it works 99% of the time, you still have thousands of complaints. Right. So it's like this balance between growing the business itself, growing the online community, managing an online community, um, and figuring out how we get enough work done every day to grow the business. Oh yeah, but in juxtaposition with that, like we have a big community problem and a small company problem, right? Like we have 12,000 writers, um, you know, the most recent problem we have is like 4,000 uh, wrong dates of publication. So like that, that is a different set of problems. But the one that we want to talk to you about today is a small company problem, which is we have 12 people working for us uh, full time and part time. Counting us. Uh, counting us and 100% remotely. So I think it's kind of apt to talk about um, kind of our experience with working from home, mm -hmm. um, tips and tricks, you know, um, that we gather throughout the years. Uh, I've been working from home for seven years now, even including my job before Hacker Noon. Um, and David, how, how long? Uh, well, four years here, you know, growing this business. Uh, so, and before that, you know, I was traveling a lot and at a startup that, you know, grew from like five to like 125 people and, but wasn't fully remote, but was part of this movement of like Slack, uh, Yammer, Microsoft Teams, you know, this movement of like, how do we collaborate online together? Like that's a bigger movement that's being accelerated now by the, the current pandemic. And, you know, we haven't done it at a large scale, but we've done it with growing a business and, you know, having a, managing a small team. So. We sourced some questions from the community, and on Hackernoon, we've published a couple hundred, you know, work from home advice stories. So you can go there, and plenty of other hundreds of other people are talking about how to do this better. But you know, as we saw the request, and we wanted to kind of overlap, you know, what people were asking us a lot, and then locally, people are asking us too. You know, as these small businesses are trying to adapt, of like, how do I, how do I do this? You know, there's no paperwork in person anymore, and all this stuff. So it's it's forcing a lot of kind of longer term trends that. Um, you know, no one knew a pandemic was going to come, but like if it did come, a company like ours that was managing entirely remote, you know, is more used to it. Our day to day is actually 
we're fortunate that it's changed. It's, it's differing less than other people. So, you know, if we could hopefully provide some walk back and forth between some uh, bigger picture strategy and some smaller things about how to organize your day to be a more efficient, you know, remote worker uh, than you were before. Yeah, I want to get right off the bat that we feel extremely thankful that we can actually afford working from home, right? This is not the case for many, many people. And who knows how long this thing is going to last. It could be uh, months, you know, optimistically, but it could be years from now. I mean, you know, the timeline that people have been talking about, uh, 18 months of developing um, a treatment so we, we, for this. We is, want to control we control, yeah. you know, and so maybe right. uh, we get into a couple of questions we got here. Right, but I was gonna say the timeline that they're talking, the eighteen months uh, is optimistic. I, I think it's a small, like you know, couple of years. So in order to adapt to this new world, um, you know, as some company, um, they have to basically find a new normal. And for us, is really just double doubling down on what uh, what is working and what has been working, and basically continue to do what we've been doing this whole time. So, okay, let's start with the first question, which is, um, why did Hackanoon choose to be a remote company in the first place? Uh, so we didn't, we kind of stumbled into it. I mean, for a couple of years, we did have an office on Market Street, uh, yeah, one room right. office, uh, really small. Um, and it was great for customer meetings. It was great for meetings in general and the appearance of legitimacy as you're a younger company. So. There is total value to that storefront aspect, you know, beyond for whatever type of business you're in. Um, but for the most part, it was like when you're young, you got to hire opportunistically. You got to the people that believe in your site, the people that believe in your community, the people that believe in you. You know, you got to figure out a way to work with them because, like, taking something from nothing to something is going to take a lot of uh, will, you know, and you want your team members to have that have that will too. So. For me, it was like the, those people could live anywhere in the world. You know, the first contractor we ever had is, you know, was based out of Pittsburgh, you know, and it was just, that's just happened to be where he lived and he, he was, you know, so <clears throat> I guess what I'm saying is like a lot of our growth is, it's out of necessity and it's not out of, um, you know, some grand plan that we knew remote working was going to be entirely the future. Right. It's like, you got to spend your money on something. If you're spending it on physical space, you're not spending it on people. How do you spend more on people to grow the business? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, the suggestion that we shouldn't say you know too much. I guess oh, we, we tend I to say, say that. You know. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sergey. Okay, I think um, on top of that opportunistic uh, decision, right, to, to hire people remotely, from all over the world, you know, uh, that's, you know, <laughs> you know, that's more uh, affordable. I think because we are in publishing, uh, it's very important that we have people around the clock, you know, working for us, working so that when we wake up in the morning at 8 a.m., some people have already published 50 stories. Uh, hello there, Arthur. You know, he's one of our uh, contributors at first, and now he's one of our editors. And, He's one of the people a real shining star. so thankful <laughs> that we wake up in the morning and we already have the results, the fruits of, of their labor um, that we can check. So I think in publishing, uh, very important that we, if you're a small company, uh, especially a small comp company in publishing like us, to have people all over the world taking care of different time zones so that people don't feel um, not unheard, right, when they submit a story and they haven't heard back from us because we only work from nine to five. I think that's that's also part of the decision why we uh, very much value remote work. Yeah, it's, I love that the business keeps growing every single hour, you know, and someone's working on it, someone's growing it, and there's it's not nine to five, nine to five, you do 100% of your work, you have 501 to 859, the business not only does it not grow, if there's a problem, no one's there to manage it, you know, oh, yeah. so there's definitely value of like, having response time, especially so larger facing consumer businesses, you know, this is important. Uh, and, and yeah, when you have a lot of customers or a large community, you know, that's where there's just going to be problems all the time. So the quicker you uh, are aware of them and can prioritize them, the better off, you know, the team is. Uh, we have a question. Uh, how do you manage trust within the team, their team bonding culture of organization uh, from Sudi, Sudi. 
Sorry, I mean, don't say your name, but um, I think trust is absolutely vital, right? In, in um, the culture of the remote work team, for sure. Um, and I say, I'm saying this because a lot of the time in a traditional office, you have someone looking over your shoulders, right? You have accountability from different meetings throughout the day. You have people just like pop into your personal space and be like, hey, how that's going? Uh, in a remote team, it's uh, a lot harder, especially if you are operating, like you mentioned earlier, on different time zones, right? So in order to really trust that people uh, are doing their job, we really have to take care of like the initial problem in the beginning, which is hiring people that we can trust, right? Hiring people with very much high dis discipline and can manage their, their own schedule and very much don't want to be micromanaged, yeah. you know? Uh, all about, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sorry, now I'm like so self-conscious of the, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. How many times can I say that? Um, but yeah, most of our people consider themselves um, not like employees, right? Like they consider themselves contributors and they pick and choose their own area of work. Um, for example, um, take our product team. We have five people now in our product team, some part-time, some full-time, all of them contributors, all of them uh, work in a uh, pick and choose style as opposed to a traditional scrum style. So we, are, uh, we, we have been jokingly saying that we are a software company without any product managers because we don't like <laughs> everyone pick their own area of work and they have to be accountable for their own work so really um yeah the, the kind of people who we choose to be on board to to our team is very important the, the key takeaway here is if you want to go remote as an operating style and a management style it's beneficial to uh in the hiring process to emphasize more of self-starters uh, self-sustainable people, individual contributors, people that, you know, they're not used to being told what to do all the time. And if they are, it's going to, it's going to be harder. You just need to expect a longer onboarding. And uh, it's just a good thing to prioritize. And I, I think people, people that can just put on their blinders and build and then turn around and revisit where they went, like they're, they're rare, you know, so it's um, hiring is a challenge overall. And then because you're remote, you just have this little bit of extra thing that you should keep in the, the back of your head of like how much of a true self-starter and self-sustainable entity is this person and it is their work and as they yeah it's those have been the best people we've worked with you know and they just understand their job better than we do and we help them make decisions but ultimately they pick on they pick what they want to work on and when they want to work on it yeah but i also want to add uh, because you are remote um it's more important that you are explicit in your expectation and in your communication because there's not enough opportunity for like nonverbal cues right like when you are in a traditional office for stuff that like you can just like enter a room and read the room right you read the vibe and understand that oh generally this is the kind of feeling that people have over this particular area of the company or this particular project you actually have to be a lot more explicit than you traditionally would have to um in a company. So for example, um, one thing I really like in our Slack, our virtual office, is we have dedicated channels for um, different areas of the business, but we also have channels just for like functionality, right? So uh, one functional channel is the props channel that we have, um, I think created maybe a couple of months ago by Austin, one of our um, uh, developers. And really it's just a channel to celebrate small wins, right? Whenever um, uh, you know, a team member recognizes another team member's good work. It's really important that you uh, put the good work out there. It's like a virtual toast. Yeah, yeah. It's like a mini toast that takes you literally just like less than one minute to do. And it makes, you know, the people who get appreciated feel good. But also it makes you feel good about like, right, like I actually recognize that person and I put in the time and the work. I like to use it when I'm surprised. Yeah. Like, oh, I didn't know that was, that changed. Oh, you worked on that? That looks so good. Yeah. You know, so there's that, uh, yeah, it's a good feeling. Absolutely. And, um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very important also to, um, tie that in. Like I think in the next version, um, of that channel, I would like to tie that into our core values. So for example, um, uh, one of our most recent, uh, props is like props to Natasha to create this like amazing email, right? Well, why is it important to create this email? 
like sometimes when you get very, very deep into the nitty gritty of the work, you don't get to like understand the bigger picture, right? You don't understand that this company is actually like one big entity moving in one direction. Um, and we have our mission, our core values right there. So I think in, even in like small moments like that, when you celebrate the, the small wins, tying it back to like, all right, this email works because it will increase um, the number of words published, which is one of our core uh, metrics, right? We have uh, money made, uh, words published, and time reading as our main core metrics. Every time we do that, then we will understand a little bit better how um, the small sector of our job can actually affect the bigger company as a whole. And that's where it takes it takes education, onboarding, and talking through these decisions. So. If everyone understands your core three metrics, they should never work on anything that doesn't affect those. So right. every single time they're working on anything, they can go to themselves and say, how does it affect one of these three things? And if it's low, 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 or none, 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 it's probably a wise decision to teach that level of thinking and that they can move on to their, the projects that are low priority and prior, pick the ones that are you know gonna move those numbers in significant ways. Yep, um, okay. Let's talk about um, how do we structure our day, maybe? Like, um, what would we do to set ourselves up for like, a good day? Um, before that, I mean, it's, sometimes it's useful to think about the week. You know, so right. I think it's, uh, it's useful to think about your week first. Uh, the day is like, because it can change. And um, that, just for me, it's useful to start with the week. You know, I have three important meetings that are, you know, what are the three most important aspects of my business? Uh, product, editorial, and sponsors. So keeping that, you know, weekly check-in with, with the team and all relevant players is, is really important in terms of just, if those are your three most important meetings of the week, you're going to drive those three business things. So if you have a thousand meetings and there are three of a thousand, it doesn't really matter. Um, but what I try and do is I try and cap myself at two meetings a day. With my energy level, my introverted versus extrovertedness, I think it's more beneficial for me to spend six plus hours doing individual contributing work and have my two most important meetings to the Hacker New Business per day. And usually it's one internal, one external. It can change, but the key here is not overbooking. If you're in sales and you're judged by the number of calls you're doing, I totally get it. But most meetings that are requested can be handled uh, via message offline, one-to-one. -one. I'd rather spend 10 minutes or even a half hour digging into a problem and at the end of it have results, tangible things, writing, solutions, steps, implementations, all of that actually done versus one hour debating what we should do and then that then that half hour, hour doing after. So the more meanings you can cut out in life, it's usually actually a good thing, even though it can seem like you're missing out on opportunities, it means you value your time. And if you're spending a lot of meetings and they're not growing your business, that's double because you put your energy in, you put your time in, and now it's not growing your business and you're further pursuing it. So the, the more you can figure out what your most 10 important meetings of the week are and build everything around that versus, hey, I'm going to block off time and try and fill up the time with meetings. That, that's a it start the other way of what meetings you need to have to grow your business. Right. But um, to build off of that, um, one thing I want, want to point out about the meetings um, or like the lack thereof of meetings that we don't have here is uh, there's really a cost, you know, a, a huge, huge, tremendous cost to switching um, uh, mentality uh, and switching your work mode from like one type of work to like another meeting and then another meeting, another meeting, right? Like if you just structure your day around other people's agenda, you will never get your job done. So really capping our number of meetings at two really serves us the best because then we'll like be able to carve out time to actually uh, spend on deep work. So yeah, like you guys are our second meeting of the day. We have our first meeting, the product meeting in the morning where we talk about general direction of how to build the software, uh, what features to add, what features to advocate for. Very important one hour, 20 minutes meeting. This is our second meeting. Like really anything more than this, will uh, kind of dilute our attention span and really result in uh, not enough deep work done. Yep. Uh, back to the individual day. So, um, you know, we're working, we, we previously, before the pandemic, we were working like 
part time in coffee shops, part time elsewhere. Now it's all at home. You know, we've been in quarantine here for like seven, eight weeks. Um, still sane, right? Ish. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, waking up in the morning, um, I, I actually I have a battle with whether to check the phone or not. You know, some days I do, some days I don't. Uh, I, what I like about checking the phone before taking a shower is seeing the state of the business, seeing a high level of what people have worked on, seeing if there's any major fires that are going to change my day. And then I have, you know, spending that 10 or 15 minutes there and reviewing what's happened while I was sleeping. Um, I usually do it, but not always. And it's, it's helpful for when I take my shower and I have, you know, ideas floating through my head. The shower time is, for me, it's an important moment of thinking. And so having an idea of what I want to accomplish in the day is useful. But there's other times where it's like, if I can completely ignore all work, anything for the first hour, sometimes I'm better off because I'm fresher. So this balance between checking in, being fresh, and if you wake up with a great idea and you, you've been thinking about it, it's probably smart to spend the eight minutes to stop and write it all down versus, hey, let me go do something else and the idea will pass and it'll be in the ether and it'll be gone. Yep. Um yeah, is, is that all of your um, tips? That's my main battle in the morning of the first hour yeah. of the day. <laughs> um, cool. So, like, uh, about me, how I structure my day. So, I think um, it's extremely important for me to get my steps in. Um, like, if you have your uh, pedometer on your phone or, like, you have one of those devices, uh, you know this. Um, but uh, I really want to get at least 10,000 steps a day in before I start my work day. Uh, we happen to live in beautiful Colorado where uh, there's a lot of open space and a lot of uh, opportunity, you know, to just get the sunshine and without meeting anyone um, in like many miles radius. So that's uh, very fortunate. But I, I feel like I, I'm always a lot, a lot more productive if I start my day knowing that I already accomplished my goal for the day, which is 10,000 steps. Sometimes I would get less than that, but throughout the day, um, I also set my Slack uh, notification, my Slack bot to remind me to move um, every two hours. I think that's highly important to not be stagnant in your own body. Um, you know, whenever you work from home and you just like tend to get like extremely deep and extremely focused on one project, right? And like before you know it, it's already been hours since uh, since you last do something with your body. So yeah, like get 10,000 steps in in the beginning of the day and then throughout the day, just move every two hours. Um, also, like a small tip, this could also work uh, if you uh, return to an office too, is uh, whenever you need to take a bathroom break, um, choose the bathroom that's like the furthest from you as opposed to, you know, the one that's like most convenient because we all always need to do bathroom breaks, right? So like, I think it's very practical, um, you know, you just remind yourself that this is like maybe my one time in the next two or three hour window that I actually will get some steps in. Um, might as well go to the furthest uh, possible. So yeah, those are the only tips. And then I guess throughout the days, um, it's like don't feel guilty, right? Uh, to like take little breaks here and there and maybe just, just call it a day. Like sometimes you would call it a day at like 2 p.m. <laughs> I don't know if it's like, if, like helpful to mention no. that, but like, okay, there's a study. There's a flexibility of schedule right. though, uh, of like, <laughs> hey, when is your kid around? When can you get windows you know so like sometimes you get your window 5 a.m 5 a.m to 8 a.m and you get a nice three hour window other times you call the day at two and then your daughter goes to bed and you get another two or three hour window at night right like there's you have to find where you can get your pockets you know especially with so many more parents dealing with having kids at home which is just uh it's tough it's a full-time job there you know so let's add another full-time job to our responsibilities <laughs> so it's uh you gotta yeah. find your little pockets of time, and uh, you know, whenever you could, you know, you know, you know, you know, whenever you work nine a.m. to five p.m., you could only find pockets. You know what? Those, those I'm windows. gonna so pin. If you don't work uh, nine a.m. to five p.m. and you can work any time, you can create half hour windows or one hour windows or two hour windows. You know, any time of the day. I was gonna pin that, like you know, you know, comment up top. You think they can tell we've never been live before? <laughs> here, here it is. I want to pin that comment up top because I find it funny. Then there it is. <laughs> anyway, um, what I was saying is that you know uh, it's <laughs> it's important. Maybe we call this. It's no. Okay. Less power through, you know. 
it's very important to be able to choose your work window. And let's say if I call my day at 2 p.m., I'm going to be able to make up for it at an another time because I'm working from home and I'm not spending two hours commuting, three hours chatting with my coworkers or, you know, whatever amount of time doing something else that has nothing to do with my work. Um, uh, I was mentioning there's this study by the Microsoft team in Japan and, and they tried to experiment a five-day five work week versus a four-day work week. And literally, they saw a 40% boost in productivity because uh, they implement that. So really, that shows uh, us that it doesn't really matter the number of hours you work throughout a day or throughout a week. It matters more that within those number of hours, you maximize your productivity and you maximize your attention span so that you, know, you have the best, uh, op most optimal outcome, right? Uh, so we have a new question here. Um, tools for brainstorming, uh, project management virtually. Um, so our stack, you know, a lot of it's happening on Slack and Trello. Uh, it's kind of our two primary platforms there. And Trello is nice in terms of creating your flow and your board and your rules. Like we have a public board for writers coming out to request features. And as we've been testing internally of like, you know, you can choose your different stages of uh, interest, you know, downvote, upvote, uh, move through the claim a project, you know, finish a project. Uh, then we have our discourse community where some some ideas are kind of floating around, and I mean, really, a lot of one-to-one -one messaging too. Like you, anytime you one-to-one -one message instead of the group, you know, you can. So you, there's somewhat losing out in terms of the group. The rest of the group doesn't can't see this, but there's also you know the freedom to explore the idea deeper. And, you know, spend the time to talk it out with one of your colleagues. And then at the end of the conversation, you probably both have a better idea what's a better thing to build because you, you know, kind of validated and learned. So uh, the health and the comfort of doing, of keeping your, you know, your internal chats going and like, hey, you know, like I'm going to reach out to you and make sure we talk because we're not going to run into each other at the water cooler. That's not happening. Like you have to, you have to put effort into it to, to grow uh, the, the work relationship. Yeah, so I would just like to lean into Slack. Um, that's definitely my most favorite remote work uh, tool uh, virtually. And I think there's a lot of way that you can uh, create your own personal customized uh, channel so that it works the best for your team, right? So for in our case, for example, I, I pin six uh, Slack channels atop of, of uh, my Slack so that I always pay attention, pay the most attention to those channels. One of those channels is called Product Ideas. So this is just really anyone, uh, whether you work in sales, whether you work in um, uh, product, whether you don't understand anything technical, you can just put an idea out there in the wild, right? And may, for example, you can say, maybe it's a great idea for us to be able to sort comments, um, you know, so that you know what, <laughs> how many, Oh my goodness, how many people read this comment um, and kind of have this gamification system so that people are more encouraged to comment more on each uh, story. So then somebody put out that idea like months ago, right? And this and, is the funnel. You know, yeah. you want to get as many good ideas there. And, you know, then you start to look and you start to pick and right. you start to see what so, people so want to comment on. So this channel is just full of amazing ideas. So that's the brainstorming, the, the like bottom of that funnel, right? It's just full of that kind of ideas. And some of it is very out there. And some of this, it's just like a marginal improvement to your product. Doesn't matter. But then starting from that channel, because we don't have any scrum style of assigning a deadline for a developer to do any single task, like anything at all. So... Maybe somebody would like take problem with that. But because of that, a developer one day, they would like look into that channels, maybe going through the pinned item um, in that channel and be like, hmm, you know what? That idea about the common leaderboard really speaks to me today for whatever reason, I'm gonna like build it within a day. And they do, you know, like they, literally that's what they did this morning is to show us what they did uh, with the leaderboard for, for the commenting system. So I think that's one way I really love how we have uh, really utilized the uh, the Slack to our advantage. And I also uh, want to add um, this, the another thing I love about Slack, and I think would really demonstrate the health of your company and your organization, is like how many emojis are being 
uh, given or being received throughout the day, throughout the week, right? You can go to the admin uh, dashboard to see, uh, really to judge the health of your organization that way. That means uh, an idea or uh, an iteration or anything gets a lot of um, a bluff from people, you know, like people care about um, the way you think about how to do things and people care about the results. So, but there's yeah. a, there's a balance of like, also, there's also an art to turning off Slack and how, how do you stop notifications and how do you create your environment for deeper work? So as you have your brainstorming sessions and you try and get a lot of ideas, then whenever you actually pick an idea, it's a balance between going back and forth with smaller projects and what your other teammate is working on to saying, no, by design, I ignore you and I go deeper down my project and I will see you soon. <laughs> and that's good. Like if you do not do that, you're going to end up just doing a bunch of small projects and suddenly the time passed and the day is over and your big projects are in the same state they were when you woke up. So there, there is a clear balance of ignoring your team and engaging your team that you should deliberately do. It shouldn't happen by accident. It should be you set out to turn off Slack because you're about to spend all day on this big problem. And to reach this big problem, you're not even going to hit a big state of thinking for like an hour. Like you have to fight through that first hour to get to your deeper thought and be able to get into the actual details of the problem. So it's totally healthy to ignore your team sometimes. Okay, we have a new question from Shelby. Uh, how do you manage to work in a one company remotely together and still keep this work-life balance? All right, so I think this, thanks Shelby, this has got to do with the fact that we're husband and wife, right? Like this is <laughs> the undertone of the, of the question. Um, all right, so I would say we are 90% of the time uh, like totally loving it, like loving each other while also being completely professional at work and bounce idea off of each other like you can see kind of right now. But yeah, like there's definitely times that there's uh, cons to being stuck in the house with your spouse who's also your coworker. Um, and I think you, you just have to like <laughs> uh, remember the good times to like make up for the bad time um, in those times. But in, in, in order to uh, balance how we live together and how we work together. What do you think is the most important? Thing well, I understand here? you better than anybody else. So if I'm dealing with any other work problems, like I know more where she's coming from than any other work discussion I have. And sometimes where she's coming from, where I'm coming from is our personal life. And we're able to recognize that whenever that happens, because we know each other very, very well. So ultimately, if you have to spend time with someone, it's hopefully it's someone you love. And so I feel very fortunate to work with Ling and, we can find areas where and there's a lot of, you know, if we weren't husband and wife, there's such a large uh, complementary skill aspect here where, you know, I'm much more discovery, editorial, exploration, and she's much more numbers, sense, process. So it has a nice balance where we're not competing with each other on overlapping areas. It's uh, I, I need someone like Ling, whether Ling was doing it or somebody else, I, I need that more structure to the business that, um, you know, I, I sometimes fail to do it on my own. Yeah, and I think uh, we did talk about uh, certain rules that we have so that we don't uh, disrupt our life or our work too much with, you know, the other thing is, for example, we try not to talk work at all, um, you know, nighttime, <laughs> you know, during dinner time or whenever we hang out with our daughter after daycare. Well, not, not too much daycare, but we are uh, lucky enough to have her still babysat by uh, his parents. So we try to be attentive um, during those kind of hours to not let it be overrun by work. Um, but I mean, you have seen the rise in like different uh, founders coaching and all this stuff. Like these, these challenges, I mean, they're, they come to us because we're also married, but the, the challenge of how to manage a small team and tolerate your coworkers, like there's a balance between loving each other, liking each other, tolerating each other and hating each other. And there's some of the hating each other is actually natural tension of like, you want business development and software development to have a little bit of tension. You want them to have a little bit of different interests because then they advocate and we actually talk out, you know, what, what are the consequences of each growth path? And so having people with different interests is generally something good. You know, if I want a feature done, I still have to advocate it just like anyone else on the team. Mm -hmm. And I have to convince other people that there's a reason to advocate for this. It will create business value. And if other people believe it, those ideas rise up. So 
I think in a smaller team, you can still achieve this. It's not very hard. You just have to treat people equal and fair, which uh, is easier in a smaller group than a large one. Yeah, another thing I would add about the balancing thing is even though we are, uh, you know, in theory on the, in the same space, we don't have to always sync 1% of our schedules and our tasks and our whatever, you know, with each other, right? We can have our own personal preference for how we want to do things. Uh, we can go for a walk. We can start a day at a different time. We can work on different projects. So like that creates the kind of like, you know, we're not too tied to each other in that sense. Before this pandemic happened, I think I'd like to work more in coffee shop, longer period of time. And David likes to like have the flexibility to like work in different rooms in the house, you know, for longer period of time. Yeah, so, if I'm struggling, I go to the room with no natural light. <laughs> and I force myself to just stare at the computer. If I'm feeling good and energetic and things are just flowing, you know, I like to sit closer to the window. Yeah. So, you know, like that way we do feel like we don't have to get stuck to each other <laughs> if we don't like it too much. Um, sometimes, he, you know, David would be like, okay, I I'm done working for the day. Um, you know, you go work on that. Problem. I do like to make it a dramatic moment, which is like kind of fun, you know, <laughs> throw it up in the air, throw your paper off your desk. And uh, what's the next question? Uh, let's talk about, uh, let's see, mentioning people from different backgrounds, countries. Um, what do we uh, take into account? Um, I think it's important to understand um, people's preferences when it comes to working hours, time zones, uh, you know, the kind of activities they want to do outside of work. So in like a traditional office, you really are primarily defined by the social circle in your work, right? Like if you want to go to a yoga thing at, uh, like right after work, you probably go with your coworkers. Um, or if you want to, I don't know, discuss, you know, that latest show that went on, you'll probably also discuss with, with your coworker. But in like a remote team, it's harder to have that kind of connection and you have to recognize that um, your teammates, rather than the ones that like live with you like this, uh, have different, have life outside of, you know, that Slack office that you are all in. So I think understand that, acknowledging that. So different team members uh, from our team have different work style, right? There's Atsa who's like basically up at 3 a.m., 5 a.m., and like also 10 p.m. <laughs> like throughout the day. And like you can easily talk to him. And, uh, you know, he he's pretty much your man when you want like to ask a quick question and want a quick answer. But then there's also other members who like, you know exactly this is not the hour to message them because they are... Uh, oops, you know that we live here when you see it. Yeah. Um, it's our landline. Yeah, it's our landline. Uh, it's, uh, should we? Yeah, so, so, so you know not to message them, you know, in, in, in that hour. And uh, acknowledging that they, they have different preferences and different lifestyles uh, than yours. And then another thing I would say is try to find common ground um, through you know, any way you can. We we have this random channel in our Slack where we just like post the music genres we like, uh, the TV shows we like, or, um, you know, that new book that was really interesting to us. So con connecting to your coworkers that way um, could, you know, you know, reach out your uh, circle a little bit more so that you can understand your, your coworker who's very remotely and you haven't even seen in person. I think there's a few people we have never seen in person more just more than just a slack person well, we, we do, real do person. periodic meetings together in person um so not everyone uh but we've done you know getting together once a quarter once a year twice a year whatever you know your budget allows the money you don't spend on physical space is money that you can spend on travel and you can get people in a conference together go to the conference and then you know work on the software for two weeks so you know we before this we were trying to do once a quarter you know, so we'll figure out what happens after the pandemic, but it is important to spend face-to-face -face time together and align yourselves for a longer term, you know, a half a year, a year, or two years, and where, where do you want to go so you can have those discussions in person. Um, it is really beneficial, and it, it does suck that, you know, that can't really happen at this time, right. but 
um, when it can, you know, I, I will do it and I will recommend it. And it's, it's a good way to, you know, align in person for a while, spend a bunch of time together, then go your separate ways and just keep going with business. Yeah. Yeah. I really miss that. I mean, I, I don't want to devalue, uh, you know, the realness yeah. of being physically together in person. It's, it's still very important. Every time we make all of this all company quarterly meetings happen, we have more ideas bounce off of each other, more projects that get done. Uh, the last time Dane and Austin were here, I think they did like a hundred or something pull cool requests, uh, you know, out of like 666 they've ever done. There's some ridiculous amount of, of numbers that, of that they were able to, to write. So there is something to be said about being in the same room with someone. But since we can't really do that now, you know, we have to think about all the ways that our company has still been working extremely well without meeting each other. Uh, you know, like, cause all of those uh, quarterly meetings, which is two or three weeks at a time, the majority of the time we are spending apart and we still can function to this day. So I think we would continue doing that and, you know, be, be grateful that we, we, we can still lean on to that. Um, getting a little tired. Yeah, me <laughs> too. This is our first live video. If you guys want any more, let us know. I don't know. You know, we're just kind of testing it out like everybody else. Um, if you have any more questions, like maybe like comment uh, below. Otherwise, maybe we should like sum up within the next two minutes or so. Yeah. Um, so what would be like your quick tips you know, summarize about working from home? Um, be self-disciplined. Uh, get excited about it. You know, find the projects you like. There is, uh, you have freedom of space, have freedom of ideas, pick the ideas you like. And there, there has to be a buildup of trust that your team will pick ideas that are also good for the business. Um, it, it's nothing too, like, it's not, it's funny, making a business, whether you're in person or remote, is it really that different? You know, we're an internet business, we use the computer, we use the internet, <laughs> like, but there is, uh, you know, be, don't be afraid to value your mental health, don't be afraid to take a mental health day on days where you're not feeling great, you know, communicate it clearly and uh, prioritize where you're going to make up for your work, but like, it's fine to take a mental health day, you know, it's fine to get excited about a project and work for a really long time on it, so... For me, I, I try and ride the highs when I'm excited about it and weather the lows and uh, do that, you know, because it's just a little more exaggerated when you're on your own. It's the same in the office, but because you're on your own and you don't have that person to just look over your shoulder or look next to you and reaffirm like, hey, it's okay. Like, that's a good idea. You know, so there's uh, that level of self-confidence and self-doubt that you have to walk the line and, and deal with it. And I mean, if you're growing your team, it's really just... You want people that are a little more independent than if you had if you were all in the same room together. And you know, it's, this isn't Wolf of Wall Street, and you get your little script, and you hear everyone reading the same script all day to sell penny stocks. Like it, you, know, you want people that take a little more and can pick the important, bigger projects and prioritize the smaller ones. So it's a little more decentralized, a little more individual contributor focused, and I think that's how you kind of level up a small elite team. Yeah, and for me, my tips would be. Uh, get moving. This is true whether or not you work from home, but especially true if you work from home, like you just tend to be okay with being in your pajama or in one position all day. It, you know, you shouldn't. So get moving. Um, <laughs> good posture. Good po posture, yeah. <laughs> um, what else? Be explicit in your communication and your messaging with people because there's not much else that people can pick up on rather than the content of your message. Um, so be explicit in that. Another thing would be uh, to, uh, I think that's it. <laughs> that's my most two important All things. All of your knowledge. Out, outside of what you already said, right? That's it. <laughs> All right, so we'll talk to you later. Um, we'll be on the internet, we're around. Uh, we hope you have a safe day. Wash your hands. Celebrate small wins. That small was my wins. other thing. That's it. This was a nice small win. Good meeting number two. Yay. All right. Bye. Bye, Internet. Wow. We have more people in exiting. I mean, entering. How do we, we exit? Is this like a lifelong thing? We just go live.
this is it from here on out. Thanks for joining. We, uh, can we, is it possible? Sweet. We have one person that said it was interesting and helpful. I'm glad that it helps at least one person. Let's shut it down. <laughs> All right. Bye. And love you.